Okay, so there are three things that keep me up late at night. Worrying about the fate of the world, the $5 box at Taco Bell, and of course, Severance Theories. I haven't experienced a show this crazy since Lost. Welcome to the sustenance edition of Severance Theories, episode number nine. Hope you're in the mood for some theory crafting because that's all I've got. So get comfortable, and by comfortable, I mean tighten the tinfoil. In this episode of Severance Theories, we're going to examine some of the best and wildest theories out there as we try to figure out some of the show's biggest mysteries. But first, spoiler alert, this is a theory series. So as you might have guessed, you're going to be inundated with details about the show. So this is your last chance to hit the exit ramp before you go barreling off into the unknown with the mayor of Theory Town. But before we begin, I'd like to thank the channel patrons, the executive producers on the show. And with that, I'd also like to welcome our newest member, Kennedy2003. Thank you so much for choosing to join and support what I do. I can't say thank you enough. Look for your name in the credits of all uploads going forward. If that sounds like something you'd also like to do, check out the description for the link to the Patreon. We gotta plug the Discord. If you're looking for a chill spot to discuss Severance, Black Mirror, Yellow Jackets with other tinfoilers, this is the place. It's like Reddit minus the snark. Okay, now you can't see me, but I'm literally rubbing my hands together like a villain right now. Tinfoil tight? Alright, let's dive. In Severance, we don't get a whole lot of information about the world beyond the quaint little town of Cure P.E. One thing we do know is that Severance supposedly takes place close to the current day, but in an alternate timeline, which means there are a number of possible differences between our world and this one. Obviously, we haven't discovered all of them yet, but we can make some educated guesses based on the scant number of clues that we do get in the episodes. In other words, we speculate because... That's what I do! This is a very common general theory that I've seen on many of my dives, and it comes from some of the peculiar circumstances that often come up around eating and food in this show. I'm sure you've picked up on at least one of the examples. Take for instance, the foodless dinner party that Mark is dragged to by his sister Devin. At this party, they sit around a table and talk. Nothing weird about that yet, but they call it dinner. First of all, why not just call it a party or a get together? But anyway, you remember this guy, right? Patton? Of course you remember Patton. Who could forget Patton? Oh, Jesus. When they're sitting at the foodless dinner table, Patton says something to the effect of, food is not life, it's just fuel. At first impression, this line might be interpreted as Patton basically saying, we don't need the pretense of gathering to eat just because we want to sit down and have a conversation. We can do it without food. Okay, so far so good. But then there's this line delivered by everyone's favorite weirdo just a few minutes later. Right? Uh, absolutely. I, you know, I was saying my friend in Lima hasn't had a food-based dinner event in... Yeah, you, you heard that, right? Now, that stuff about food not being life hits a little bit different. On its own, I wouldn't think much of this. Not enough evidence, and it's just a little detail to add some color to the backdrop. A little lore for the world of Severance, maybe. But many people have pointed out that this is really odd, and the amount of attention this idea is given by the writers prompts some fans, including yours truly, to conclude that the whole thing is a little bit suspect, especially when you consider all of the other strange food-related facts throughout the series. Some theories say that this is one of a few clues that indicates that food is scarce in the world of Severance, and it might be that Lumen became a major food producer after some world-altering catastrophic event that made food hard to get. Nautilus, it doesn't look like anyone is starving in Kier. Well, the answer to that is that the town of Kier only looks normal because it is run by Lumen. Lumen towns may be a kind of oasis in a dystopian world. As it turns out, escaping Lumen might be like jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. The real outside world might be far worse than anything we could guess right now. Another fact we can verify is that the foodless dinner thing is not normal, or at least it isn't to Mark or Devin. Both characters make remarks that tell us that they think the idea is kind of strange and unusual. So what's my take on the food is scarce theory? I think it's a sexy concept at this stage in the story, but maybe it's a bit cliche as a plot element, but how likely is it? I'm gonna say... Not bloody likely! <laughs> like I said, I do like the idea overall, and I wouldn't be mad if the writers decided to go this way, because there are ways to make this work and have it still be novel in its execution. I don't see enough there as far as story clues to think that this is something we should expect. I definitely agree that the writers are intentionally being weird about food in Severance, because the writers are being so careful about making sure that it feels strange. Ben Stiller quoted as saying that the fact that there was no food at the foodless dinner does actually mean something, but he's super about it. So yeah, thanks for nothing. Ben. We do see Mark eat a sandwich that could use a lot more meat and cheese, but that's besides the point. One other thing I do like about this theory is that it posits that the town we see outside of Lumen is not the real, real world, and that just sounds instinctively true. I'm gonna give this one two and a half mil chicks for being a cool theory that just doesn't have legs yet. That's not as bad as it sounds. I'm a tough critic. 
If there's one theory that I keep coming back around to, it's this one. theory that Lumen is lacing their products with a substance that they're using to manipulate people with. This theory, like the food scarcity theory, comes from a larger set of small details that may actually amount to evidence that there is a real there there. Let's go over some of these details that might be clues. So we know that Kier got his start as a successful industrialist through the creation of salves, a category or a kind of medicinal lotion that's meant to be absorbed into the body through the skin. Over time, Lumen has has grown its line of products to include things like regular lotions, deodorants, and toothpastes, as we learned from Peggy in the Lexington letter. This establishes that Lumen makes a variety of water-based products that would give them a method to spread something through their use to an unsuspecting public, should they want to. By the way, if you haven't already, I suggest you read the Lexington letter, it's free, and once you're done, you can check out my video on it, it's a must if you're a fan of the show. Another strange item is MDR's orientation pamphlet. In this pamphlet, Lumen makes sure to remind the employees that they need to wash their hands a lot. Let's just say very frequently. This seems a bit excessive and I can't deny that it looks like an intentional poke at the audience, a hint that something is off here. Lumen's name is displayed across a water tower in this transition scene. Could be nothing, but knowing these writers, I think it's meant to signal more than Lumen's seeming omnipresent shadow they cast over every square foot of the town. I think it could be a hint at how Lumen influences the local population talked about the water but let's talk about soap for a second i give you exhibit a the weird conversation between mark and irving irving makes an interesting point when talking about the liquid soap that goes into the dispensers at mdr's area of the floor irving asks why isn't the soap labeled soap good question why wouldn't it be labeled soap maybe because it's not we can assume that this is lumen's recipe whatever it is again the booklet says wash your hands frequently no doubt using this soap could it be that the soap isn't just soap and the writers are hinting at this fact through their choice to make this unusual exchange between mark and irving Mark is trying to convince Helly to stop trying to beat the code detectors by smuggling out a message. He warns her of the bad soap as an especially uncomfortable outcome for anyone who tries to skirt Lumen policy on sending messages to the outside. What exactly is bad soap? Is it a euphemism for a rough day at the office because you were a naughty employee? Or is it a literal substance management uses to exert control? Kind of reminds me of when your parents said they were going to wash your mouth out with soap. Bad soap also sounds like break room or waffle party, neither of which are anything like what you would expect them to mean. If I invited you to a waffle party and this happened, you'd be surprised to say the least. Enough about me, let's talk about you. And that means pulling some of your theories from the comment section to discuss. So this is Liz Duck Chang's comment. Not sure if you've mentioned it already, but a line that stood out to me on rewatching is when Mrs. Selvig is at Devin's place and mentions something like, you don't have maids to look after you. And it got me thinking, what if Selvig has this nursing knowledge because that was her role to the most recent generation of Egan's and potentially the latest in a long line of like nurses who raise Egan children. And so she was one of the people, if not the person who looked after Helena after she was born. But now that there are no new Egan children, question mark, she's taken on a different role. Looking after severed people is actually far more similar to looking after actual children than being a regular manager. Actually, that was a question. I should have said that as a question. Anyway, you get the point. But about Liz's theory, when we first meet Harmony, she's introduced as a manager who is annoyed by the fact that she's been forced to move into a new office but we're never told why or where she was right before this. This seems to be intentional. The writers are stingy with the info here, but we do learn that Selvig has an awful lot of knowledge about maternity and newborn childcare. And it doesn't come off as purely first-hand knowledge from her experiences as a mom. It really seems professional very formal. When you take that into account and add the fact that she's probably been working for Lumen for a good portion of her life, the idea that she could have served the family in this capacity makes a lot of sense. From a story perspective, this would further bind her fate with that of Lumen, and it fits well with her reverence for all things Kier, including her willingness to always be of service. Even after she gets canned, she would see the opportunity to raise Egan royalty as a chance to be closer to them and further ingratiate herself with the family. Also, when you think about it, this tracks because Harmony speaks to every Everyone on the floor with the condescension and resentment you'd expect from an irritated and overworked babysitter. Let's kick this up a notch. Liz, I see your theory and I'll raise you one ream of premium Reynolds tinfoil. I think I may have mentioned this before, but I'm not sure. But there is a theory that Rick and Helly might be cousins. This one posits that Selvig was involved in raising Helly or Ricken, or perhaps both, and that she is very familiar with both of them because she's known them since they were children. This, of course, would require that Ricken be severed for it to work, but 
That doesn't seem like much of a stretch now, if I'm being honest. This is an easy four and a half mil chicks. It's certainly plausible, and we have a fair amount of reason to think that she has the occupational skills from a role that we haven't been shown yet. It just makes sense. So thanks for sharing. Harmony Coble, Severed Sitter Extraordinaire. Shout out to Michael Chernus, by the way. Also, go watch Patriot if you haven't already. He's really good in that. By the way, I learned today the difference between lotions, ointments, salves, and balms. All these years and I had no idea. So that about wraps this one up. There are so many more interesting details to note about food, but as I mentioned, it's hard to fit all of it in one video. I mean, you got the waffles, the melons, the eggs, spicy candy, the dried vendor snacks, that single french fry once again. Some of those things might have a story to tell. With that said, I still think it's the water, but hey, I'm a little biased. Be good to yourselves, be safe, and I'll see you in the next broadcast. Till then, off you go.